Good morning, folks. Um, this is, uh, well, looking at the Luke 17 passage, what we'll be doing, make sure you keep that close at hand. This is one of those parts of the Bible that's filled with very Christian-sounding things that the more you look at them, the more difficult they become. Uh, it's like those pictures people say, you know, the more things you stare at, the more that you'll notice uh, that's wrong with the picture. It's a little bit like that uh, in Luke 17. There are some really deep challenges in here if we should stop to take the time uh, to appreciate them. Uh, it's understandable in one sense, Jesus is speaking to the disciples, to those who are going to be leaders uh, within the early church. That's where he began in earlier chapters. He's continuing here. Uh, it's fair to understand that it just follows straight on from the last section. He's still speaking to them uh, about what uh, they should be, who they should be, uh, as they follow him from here. And he says to the disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, uh, but woe to anyone through whom they come. Uh, now, we need to understand what's happening here. He's talking about stumbling blocks. That's another way you might have heard uh, this read before. And we get the image of a stumbling block, right? Pretty easily. It's a block that you stumble over. It's quite straightforward, really, because it's there. So you trip on it. It's like a rock on the path uh, as you go along. Uh, or the trigger of a trap, like a mouse trap. Have you ever set those old fashioned mouse traps uh, before? There's a little trigger that, as soon as you activate it, it springs shut. And once that's happened and you're trapped, it's too late. Uh, that's the idea here behind stumbling blocks something that trips you up. And once it's triggered, uh, it has. Uh, tripped up your faith. There's some catastrophic event uh, that has compromised uh, your faith. Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. It's inevitable. That's the first thing that we notice here. It's going to happen. They will come. Uh, people can't expect to just cruise through life and have everything fall into place, to have our faith just unchallenged from uh, day one to whatever the last day might be. Uh, those stumbling blocks don't have to be huge, they don't have to be uh, global uh, or dramatic in that sense, but they will come. Things will happen that can cause us to trip up in our faith. And so we need to be intentional in how we choose to follow Jesus. Day by day, week by week, we need to make the choice to follow Jesus. It won't just happen on autopilot. That's the first thing we notice. The second thing we notice is a fairly grim warning Right? This thing is inevitable. We will see people fall away, but woe to anyone through whom they come. Oh, that's even heavier. Uh, it would be better for that person, Jesus says, to have a millstone tied around your neck. A millstone, it's a big heavy circle of stone with a hole in the middle that they used for grinding grain. Uh, it would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea than to be the person through whom someone should come to stumble. Now, if you're not shocked by what Jesus has just said, you should stop and take a moment to be shocked by it. Obviously, he's using hyperbole, he's exaggerating, he's not anticipating that the early church is going to be filled with people having millstones tied around their neck and thrown into the ocean, uh, but he is making a point, isn't he? It would be better to be drowned than to cause a little one to stumble. Uh, now, who are the little ones? If you, if you read that and you immediately thought of children, I think that's our natural instinct to think that, oh, Jesus is talking about uh, teaching children. And in Matthew's Gospel, I think it is, he speaks and says this in the presence of a number of children. But I think it's telling us something bigger about ourselves as well. And I think particularly for those of us who are adult Christians, who have been Christian for a while, we tend to feel we are not the ones who might stumble. We tend to feel we are the ones who are immune from that. We're secure. We've got faith worked out. We became adults. We've been at church for a number of years. And so warnings are for other people. They're for teachers who are speaking to children, not for people like us uh, who come along to church and are secure. Uh, now, Jesus is speaking to those who have leadership roles. He's speaking to his disciples. But I think this warning is for all believers. And the little ones are not necessarily just children. It's not just for people working with children. The little ones are just those who are learning in their faith, for those who are progressing in following Jesus, for those whom we are trying to teach and encourage. And it would be better, he says, to have a millstone tied around your neck than to cause someone else to stumble. Now, he's speaking to his disciples, 
Uh, but ultimately, he's talking to all believers. And the warning is that our words, our actions, impact other believers and non-believers. Uh, surveys tell us that uh, the number one thing that puts people off Christianity, the number one thing that makes people reluctant to come into a church or has made people stop going to church uh, is not their concept of God, uh, it's not the Bible, uh, it's not the Gospel, it's the way that they see Christians acting or the way they've been treated by other Christians. And so, Jesus' warning here is not insignificant. To His disciples, He says, watch out, be alert to the impact of your behaviour, be aware that the way we act can cause someone to stumble. Uh, so, there you are, immediately, that's the first thing that Jesus has to say in this passage and that's something pretty heavy to think about uh, and He doesn't let up in verse 3, it gets even harder. Again, on the surface, very simple statement, but when it comes to putting it into practice, it's very hard to do. Uh, verse 3, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. Uh, now, what's going on here? Well, rebuke, uh, first of all, it's a harsh word, but it just means speak seriously. Uh, rebuke them means saying, don't let those things slide, don't, don't avoid confrontation, right? If a wrong has been done, if harm has been done, don't just try to sort of slide around the outside uh, and ignore that and let it fester. Deal with it, confront it, uh, ensure that sin is dealt with properly. But immediately, again, there are all kinds of challenges within this verse. Number one uh, is that some of us, that's the easiest thing in the world. Uh, some of us are very good at rebuking, some of us love rebuking, some of us are only too happy to speak about how other people should have acted, uh, to talk about how this person or that person could have done better and if only everyone had listened to me, none of this would have ever happened. Some of us are great uh, when it comes to the rebuke, uh, but some of us are wound the exact opposite way. Some of us not only are uncomfortable about rebuking others, some of us struggle with self-judgment. Some of us, when we're wronged, are far more likely to think, well, maybe I deserved it. Uh, maybe, maybe this is just what I should expect. Maybe it's right that this happened to me. And some of us would just rather avoid the conflict. Uh, and so, this is difficult immediately, isn't it? And of course, even the word rebuke suggests a power imbalance, doesn't it? We typically rebuke people who we view as occupying a lower social space, than us, people who are under our authority. We don't rebuke equals, we don't rebuke superiors, we rebuke those whom we think are below us. And all of that tells us that we are confronting a very difficult part of the Bible to deal with. It sounds very simple, if a wrong has been done, forgive it, uh, but it is in fact quite hard. Now, the key interpretive point here is about reconciliation. The key is not identifying who is right and wrong, who are the good people. It's not about forcing people to repent or whatever else it may be. The key is reconciliation. The key is about the resolution of conflict, right? This is our goal in this verse, and ensuring that those divisions, those conflicts are not things that we allow to grow and strangle the life out of our church, right? Tying that back to the stumbling block idea, not allowing conflict to become a stumbling block for anyone. So, those two parts fit together uh, because conflict is exactly the kind of thing that causes us uh, to stumble. The problem is conflict can bring out the worst in us uh, and also because of those power imbalances and because of the hurt that sin can bring about, this exact scenario is one of those which is the most open to abuse. So, what do we do? Well, let's have a little look at what the passage actually says. Let's paint a picture of the ideal uh, of forgiveness and then we'll try and pick our way through the complexity as best we can. So, one thing to notice about this is that the intent, and it doesn't always easily work out that way, but the intent is this is settled in-house. Right? This is not about dividing the church up into sides, it's not about uh, going to other people to talk about what's been done to you. It says, if someone sins against you, then go and speak to them. Uh, at this stage, there's nobody else involved. Uh, there might be a place for mediation, Matthew 18, the other Bible reading speaks about what you can do if the other person is not willing to listen. Uh, but the idea, the ideal from the very beginning 
is that conflict is resolved by bringing people together uh, where hurt has been done. Now, for that to happen, there has to be grace, doesn't there? There needs to be grace. You can't do that without grace. That's the point of verse 3 and 4. The point of verse 3 and 4 is that if a wrong has been done, you have the opportunity for retribution, for vengeance and justice. And if that is the, ch- the case, then choose grace. Choose to forgive and restore uh, rather than to divide. Uh, and what that points us towards is that grace is one of the most transformative forces in the world. But of course, we also know that grace is not our default when we've been hardened. Forgiveness is difficult. It's easy to bear grudges against people. And it's easy to be unrepentant uh, and even double down when we're confronted in our sin. It's easy to be embarrassed uh, by our sin, to avoid those conversations rather than deal with them. So while the language is simple, this scenario is hard to enact. But we can see the ideal. We can see the ideal. Uh, The ideal is the case where someone has wronged another person, you go and calmly point out that fact to them, uh, their fault. And when that happens, when your fault is pointed out, the other person should ideally apologise. And when they have, you forgive them and it's forgotten. And that relationship can move on. Uh, No matter how many times, Jesus says, there doesn't come a point where grace runs out. And that's important because that's telling us something, isn't it, about the character of God. There isn't a point where grace and forgiveness runs out. That's what Jesus is saying, right? That's the ideal. That's what God does. Uh, Now let's talk about reality. Uh, Forgiveness is really complex. Uh, And anyone who has had to genuinely forgive something big knows just how complex forgiveness is. Some things are trivial, okay? If you and I have arranged to meet up for coffee and if for some reason I'm half an hour late, uh, I might arrive... You might be slightly annoyed, you've had to wait, it's boring, whatever else it may be, uh, and then I apologise to you, and it's a fairly trivial thing. You might be a bit put off, but you'll probably forgive me, and it's unlikely to have major implications for how we relate to each other or for the life of the global church going into the future, okay? Trivial scenario, easy one to forgive. But even having said that, sometimes we do struggle to be gracious, don't we? Even with small things. Uh, And for some of us, and you may know if this is you, if you're the sort of person who carries around grudges for every little offence that's been done, if you're someone who secretly delights in gossiping about the failures of others, and let's be honest, Christians are amongst the worst in those spaces, then this should be an encouragement from God to stop it. Uh, That that's not what we should be. We should be forgiving people. But... As we've said, those are things that it's very easy to forgive and move on from. What about big things? What about big harm? How about a complex scenario to road test this verse on? What about abuse? What about domestic violence? Because here is a significant black mark on the church historically. In the past, and even to this very day, Uh, in some contexts, if within the church a person came and revealed that their partner had been abusive against them, the response was often some variation on this verse. The response was to say, well, they said sorry, and so as a Christian, you should be forgiving and forgive them. That's your job. They've repented, now you have to do your job uh, and forgive them. But is that really what Jesus is saying here? Uh, Because we know, don't we, that that's exactly how those cycles of violence work. Uh, We know that they're not one-off incidents. They're typically patterns of behaviour where a person is violent, where a person does some great harm, but then they apologise and act as if it's going to be different from now on, but then exactly the same thing happens over and over again. And so, in a blunt application of a verse like this, to forgive and move on as though nothing has happened... Uh, Many times in the past, people have been sent back into violent and harmful situations uh, to suffer even more harm uh, from their abuser. Uh, And on top of that, a black and white reading of a verse like this tends to heap guilt onto the person who has been hurt, 
because it says, well, you should be even more forgiving. Jesus says, if you're really a Christian, you have to be forgiving. They've said, sorry, so now it's all up to you uh, whether you're going to be a real Christian. And so we tend to put the guilt upon the person who's been hurt uh, rather than the one who has done uh, the harm. I was struck this morning just reflecting uh, that the very first sermon uh, that I preached here um, some time ago was on John chapter 8 and the woman caught in adultery. And the unusual thing about that story is the whole thing focuses on her guilt uh, and yet never makes a mention of the one whom she was caught in adultery with. Uh, And so we've remembered her uh, as the guilty party uh, when he's taken off and doesn't even make it into the record. So a blunt application of this verse can do a great deal of harm. But our temptation is to say, but that's not us. We wouldn't do that. Uh, We're much better than that. But we need to be very, very careful how we handle God's Word so that our application uh, doesn't hurt vulnerable people, that we don't cause anyone to stumble and so that we don't play into the hands of abusers. And so what can we do? Well, I think that example hopefully helps us to see something about the complexity of forgiveness Uh, and also to see that there is more to forgiveness than a simple let's carry on as though nothing ever happened. Uh, One of the key parts of forgiveness is our act of striving to release our need for retribution, for our working to let go of the baggage that we carry from past wrongs done to us so that we can begin to heal uh, and begin to grow again. And if we understand that, we start to see that forgiveness is not just about our obligation towards someone else, uh, how that experience changes us. Because sometimes it's really easy to let go of harm. We spoke about those trivial examples early on. But sometimes it can be hard. Sometimes you can want to forgive, you can choose to forgive, you can think that you've forgiven a person, you can think it's dealt with, only to find that seeing them again or hearing about them or something else just brings all of those memories, all of those past experiences back up to bubble and overflow again. Sometimes it takes a really long time to forgive. Sometimes you might need to make that choice a hundred times, a thousand times, even more every time it rises up again. Uh, Forgiveness isn't simple and it's really important that we recognise that and it's really important that we allow ourselves and others space to work forgiveness through. And if you are trying to forgive but you are finding that hard, uh, if the harm is so great uh, and if the consequences are still something that you feel, uh, you shouldn't feel guilty because it's a struggle. Uh, this is not here for you to feel guilty. Uh, you might help, need help working through that process from friends, uh, from a professional, uh, and that's okay too, and that is a good part of that healing. And in those extreme cases, like domestic violence, like abuse, forgiveness won't mean, or may not mean, full restoration. Uh, in this life, that may be an impossible thing, at least in human terms. But the choice to forgive does mean healing. And as you do the hard work to release that need, you grow in grace. Because Jesus' intent here is not to make victims of harm feel guilty. Jesus' intent here is to help us and encourage us towards relational health as a community. Because while forgiveness and grace is really difficult to work through, it is always better for us. Uh, And I think, as we've said, this is a very easy thing to read, a very difficult thing to apply. I think for once the disciples seem to get it. Because Jesus has just said this to them. He said, look, it doesn't matter how many times these things happen to you. If you, if they repent, you need to forgive. And how the disciples respond? Piece of cake? No, they say, increase our faith. Uh, And it makes you think maybe they've actually understood Jesus for the first time. This is a hard thing. Uh, that he is talking about. Uh, But, at the same time, one of the greatest testimonies that we can have as believers uh, is our demonstration of grace towards each other. Uh, It's striking, isn't it, how often we think 
that to be an effective witness, we need the church to be more powerful. We need to be more significant. Uh, you, might, you might know what I mean. Uh, if, we, if we value cleverness, if we think cleverness is the ultimate virtue, we will hold up intellectual arguments that seem to demolish the worldview of people who disagree with us. And we will say that's a show of Christian superiority, uh, that we're smarter than other people. Uh, or if we value spiritual things, uh, we will hold up signs and wonders and say, here is the evidence of the power of God uh, over the power of the world. Uh, or if we value the Western dream of wealth and family, uh, we'll hold up our success in those areas as proof of our faith, uh, a triumphant uh, sign of how wonderful we are. But a community defined by grace, uh, I think is a miracle on par, if not exceeding any of those things. I think it's potentially the most powerful witness we can have uh, as the church. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, more people are put off Christianity by the way Christians act towards others than anything else. Uh, Titus 2 verse 12 tells us that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Uh, grace teaches us to forgive. Grace teaches us to love. Uh, Matthew 18, our other reading, takes it even further. There, uh, Jesus tells the parable of the unmerciful servant. It's one of my favourite stories uh, in the Bible. It's absolutely brilliant, even though it's brutal. Uh, the story goes, there's a king and two servants. Uh, there's a bunch of other servants as well who tell on the bad one in the end. Uh, but the king forgives the first servant a massive debt, a debt that he could never repay. Uh, and simply because he asks, uh, the king forgives this debt. But then that servant immediately turns around, grabs his fellow servant and demands that he repay everything, has him thrown back into prison uh, for a relatively tiny debt. And the king turns around and says to the first servant, after I forgave you, how could you act like that? Knowing my grace towards you, this king who represents Jesus, represents God in the story, says, knowing the love I have poured out on you, how can you treat another person like that? And the parable ends with the unmerciful servant himself hurled into jail, with the warning, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Like I said, uh, fairly brutal. Grace matters. But how do we replicate that? Well, we can't, can we? We can't be that forgiving. We are not that forgiving. We are flawed, faulty people. If you've ever had someone do you a serious harm, something significant, you would know that those wounds leave scars and that those scars don't disappear. Uh, it's rare, if not impossible, to demonstrate the grace that God seems to call us to. But we can pray, Lord, increase our faith. Uh, God is good, and how powerful is verse 6 in that context? If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, uh, you can say to this mulberry tree, tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Uh, I don't know what Jesus has in for mustard seeds, uh, sorry, for mulberry trees, it's mountains in uh, other versions, translations you might have heard, a mountain can be up, uprooted and thrown into the sea. Uh, but in context, and again, I don't know how you've heard this verse used, like we often hear this verse used to say like, oh, see, whatever faith you have can do amazing and powerful miracles, but that's not Jesus' point here, uh, right? In the context of this passage about being a community defined by grace and forgiveness uh, in order to not harm the faith of another, Jesus is saying, look, even if your faith is so small, that it would barely register using an electron microscope, uh, God can work through that. God works by His grace through whatever we have. You don't have to be a super Christian. You don't have to have the power and ability to forgive all wrongs perfectly and instantaneously. All you need to do is trust in God's grace and to reflect, to echo that back to others as best you can, and to lean on His love to sustain you through it all. That doesn't sound very impressive, does it? You know, it sounds much more powerful to have faith that can throw mountains into the sea, but loving like Jesus loved, showing grace like God shows grace, and creating a community that is grounded in those principles, 
will do more than any mountain tossing event ever could. So be people of grace and when it's hard and when you fail, pick yourself up, lean into God and do it again. That's the, that's the, the life we have modelled for us in those verses. As much as it is possible, with whatever strength God has given you, choose to be a person of grace. So there are the hard teachings in this section. Right? There's a few verses left, uh, but surely now God is going to get to the good stuff. Right? We've, we've done the hard work, we've made sure we're not making anyone stumble in their faith, we've worked on forgiveness, we're dealing with our tiny faith, surely God's going to give us some good stuff to sustain us. He's told us to do a bunch of high, hard things, he's told us ministry is a high-risk activity, get it wrong, it's better to be chucked into the sea with a millstone around your neck, uh, and we're told that we're to be people of constant, unrelenting, repeating grace. So what's our reward? In verse 7 to 10, get ready to get inspired. Here we go, verse 7. Suppose one of you has a servant ploughing or looking after the sheep. Uh, will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now, sit down to eat? <laughs> Why do you rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink, and after that, well, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? And so also you, when you've done everything you were told to do, should say, well, we're unworthy servants, we've only done our duty. So there it is. There's our reward. You excited? It's basically saying, look, just do as you're told. Don't ask why. That's your job. But I, th I don't think that's the only point Jesus is trying to make. Uh, but I think the point that he is trying to make is that this life that he's just described is not an exceptional life for super Christians. Right? He's not saying, if you want to be great in the kingdom, if you want to be in top 10, you know, get in the, the, the rankings at the end of the month, uh, then you need to do these things. He's saying, this is the default Christian life. If you are following Jesus, this is what following Jesus looks like. It's not the pattern for super Christians, it's the pattern for all believers as we follow Jesus. What's our primary calling as disciples of Jesus? Well, to be faithful with everything that we have as best we can. Uh, this passage is a reminder that allegiance to Jesus means something. And allegiance to Jesus involves responding. It's not just a magic get-out-of-jail-free card that we put in our back pocket so we can pull out on the Day of Judgment. Uh, but there is good in being obedient, right? It's not as simple as do your job and stop asking questions. Uh, in Matthew 25, Jesus tells another parable. In fact, He tells a lot of parables uh, in which we are the servants. And so we probably should pick something up from that. But he tells another parable in Matthew 25 uh, about some servants who faithfully do their ordinary daily work as they've been commanded and they're greeted by their master at the end of the parable with a well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. There is an element of just simply doing our duty as we go about following Jesus. Our calling is to be faithful with what we have as best we can in anticipation of our welcome from our Master. The challenge is working out what that means. And I think what Jesus is reminding of through these last few verses, but through this whole passage, is that it's more than just a weekly visit to church. I don't want to downplay the importance and value of coming to church and meeting together. I think it's great to come to church uh, and meet together. But I think what Jesus is saying is that allegiance to Him transforms our entire lives. It makes us teachers of God's truth in whatever context we can. Now, that was the first part of the passage. Be people who present the life-saving, life-changing gospel in a way that reaches the lost and to live our lives in a way that is consistent with the truth that we believe. Again, not just for super-Christians, for all of us. The second part reminds us that our hearts should be transformed. Uh, we are different. Being a Christian means making that choice to let go of anger, bitterness, rage in favour of grace and forgiveness. And that's just one area of our lives. Uh, you could talk about so many others. Uh, with some thought, we could connect those dots to draw in uh, any other number of principles. Uh, and this is not just going above and beyond. Uh, this is not uh, stretching beyond what is required. We're not doing Jesus a favour but at the same time, He's not expecting us to work ourselves to death for the sake of the kingdom. 
We serve as we are able with whatever we have because that's what it is to follow Jesus. Why don't we pray? Father, we do thank you for your goodness and love. We do thank you uh, for the grace that you have poured out uh, abundantly on us. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you loved us, that you treasured us uh, before uh, we ever knew you. Uh, We thank you that you showed us that love in Jesus uh, as he came, lived, died and rose to new life so that we might die and rise with him uh, to a new life. And we pray that in your grace you would help us to embrace that new life even now. Uh, That you would lead us and draw us into that deep trust in you, uh, that abundant awareness of your love for us and that your grace might empower us to show grace for others. Uh, We do pray, Lord, uh, with those who are wrestling with forgiveness and who are wrestling with past harm. Uh, We pray that they would know that they are loved. Uh, We pray that they would know your embrace. And we pray that they would find that in the love of our community. And we pray, Lord, for those of us who cling on to our sin, uh, that we would be repentant, uh, that we would seek restoration and that we would have the humility uh, to acknowledge that. But most of all, Lord, we praise you for your grace. And we praise you for the certainty it brings. And we praise you for the hope that you have given us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.